The program will discuss plans for the 2021 bicentennial, especially how groups and individuals can become involved in programs to preserve Missouri's past and present for future generations. Dr. McKitty is a semi-retired educator. He taught for more than 20 years in the St. Charles schools and at St. Charles Community College, in addition to teaching in Louisiana, Missouri, Alexandria, Egypt, and at two schools in Saudi Arabia. Dr. McKitty is a past president of the St. Charles Historical Society, as well as past president of the Missouri Council for History Education. He is currently the M-O-C-H-E liaison with the Missouri Bicentennial Alliance. Please join me as we welcome Dr. Gary McKitty. Thank you very much. Uh, before I switch to share screens, uh, I have to do a mea culpa. Uh, Morton Todd was one of my students when he was in high school. So uh, <laughs> that tells you how long I've been around. All right, let's get a share screen here. And uh, I'm going to back up a little bit uh, to uh, talk about early Missouri history. Uh, I know one of the goals of your organization is to promote social justice. And so in looking back at the past of Missouri, uh, we need to know from where we have come to determine where we need to go. Unfortunately, recently, uh, the within the last 20 years, the Missouri legislature has removed the requirement that students graduate with a credit in Missouri history. And uh, so it's being pushed into third, fourth, and fifth grades. So that students graduate from a high school knowing a little more than the fact that there were some Native Americans here, maybe a little bit about Lewis and Clark, Daniel Boone, George Washington Carver, Laura Ingalls Wilder, and maybe Harry Truman, of whom I always think when I hear the Missouri Walls. So we are looking at uh, some, hopefully some activities uh, that started in uh, 2018 uh, that will highlight the history of our state and try to get everyone of all generations involved. And this is our Bicentennial uh, Alliance logo. If you have not read uh, uh, Walter Johnson's book, The Broken Heart uh, of America, I would recommend that you do so. Uh, it's a recent publication uh, dealing with the history from the founding of St. Louis and the treatment of Native Americans uh, all, all the way up to the Michael Brown incident uh, in Florissan, so in Ferguson, Florissan. So, uh, uh, definitely a, a, a good read uh, and uh, is available now. We first petitioned uh, the federal legislature in uh, 1818. Uh, we started circulating petitions uh, to ask to become a state and it reached Congress. They passed an enabling act and said we needed to write a constitution. Now, why did we wanna become a state? Well, obviously, where uh, the issue of what are they gonna do with the federal lands in the Western part of the state? What about uh, tariffs? Uh, our main products were tobacco and hemp. Uh, many of our uh, leaders in uh, Missouri had been involved in politics in the East and there was an upcoming election in 1820 and we wanted to have a vote. So we got enabling an uh, act passed uh, the territorial legislature presented a constitution. It was basically a copy of Kentucky's and it created a firestorm in Congress that led to that first Missouri compromise. There were a number of groups in Missouri that were wondering what was gonna happen to their rights. Uh, we don't normally think of the Catholics uh, as, as being a minority that would be concerned, but they had their own schools. They were still speaking the French language. Uh, the area in uh, Southern Missouri and in, in Central St. Louis were wondering what was going to happen with their traditions and their cultures. The Native Americans who had been pushed out of the St. Charles area in 1815 uh, into an Indian strip along Kansas and into the Platte area. 
Uh, of course, we know that eventually they're going to get pushed out and into uh, Kansas and then down uh, into Oklahoma. There also were settlers from the east who had come in uh, during the last days uh, of Spanish-French occupation. Uh, and I'll talk in a minute about uh, why there was question about some of the grants that they had gotten. And of course, that issue of uh, what about the African-Americans in the state, both free and enslaved persons. So the Catholics were very concerned. Uh, would all of the schools become secular? Uh, would they be allowed to continue collecting the church tax that supported uh, the Catholic churches? Uh, under French and Spanish rule, uh, we had had people like in 1818, Bishop de Borg arrived uh, coming up the, the river, performing mass in St. Genevieve, founding St. Louis University. He brought with him Rose Philippine Duchenne, uh, our favorite saint in St. Charles, uh, who broke many of the laws uh, of the territory and of the new, sit, uh, new state by uh, educating African-American girls, which were te technically illegal. Uh, one of the families that I'll be talking about mentioning later on, Joseph Bogey III, he's an ancestor uh, of, um, Missouri Senator, uh, who uh, his father uh, was involved in lead mining, uh, did own slaves, um, his, uh, he's Kit Bond's ancestor. And uh, his uh, grandfather ran uh, trading posts along the Arkansas River. And they were wondering what was gonna happen to their concessions. Uh, the Native Americans, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Sacred Sun and Osage. If you look at this map, this shows where the Osage were. By the time 1818 comes along and we petitioned to be a state, they're in this area up here and in a very small strip in the southern part of Missouri right here. They're gonna get pushed across the border and then down into Oklahoma. During the last days of the Spanish-French occupation, you remember we had, had been French the French king had given us to, the, to, to, the, to his brother-in-law, who was king of Spain, brother who had become king of Spain. Uh, and then uh, when Napoleon came over, uh, he got it back and very quickly sold it to the United States, sort of ironically so that he could build ships to attack the English because uh, we borrowed a lot of the money from British banks. So the British loaned the money uh, to us to uh, buy the territory. We gave it to the French who used it to build their the Napoleon's Navy. But the last governor, uh, Charles Carlos de Lassus, in the days that he knew were his final days, had given out huge tracts of land as grants. Now, technically, in order to make those legal, you had to go to New Orleans. And a lot of people hadn't done that. So there was a question as to whether these land grants would be legitimate. So we had a number of people who were saying, what's going on? Now we submitted our constitution based on the constitution of Kentucky. Uh, Senator Talmadge introduced a resolution that said, all right, you can have slaves in Missouri, but no new slaves could be brought into the state and all slaves in the state would become free at age 25. It passed the US House of Representatives, but of course it died quickly in the Senate. Uh, we had had uh, about 10,000 enslaved persons uh, at the time that we uh, request our, to become a state. By the time we get to 1860, we've got 114,000 enslaved people within the state. So the Northwest Ordinance had said no slavery basically above the Ohio River. Some people wanted to draw that uh, line across uh, and say, okay, all territories above would become free. Those below would become slave, but that wasn't part of the law. So we become embroiled in this national debate over slavery. Uh, Pro-slavery, they were property. Uh, we had uh, huge, uh, areas, particularly Callaway County uh, and the area down around St. Genevieve. 
Uh, we didn't have the huge plantations of three or 400 slaves doing cotton. Uh, most of our plantations uh, were between 100 and, and 25 slaves, uh, mostly uh, tobacco and hemp, uh, even right here in St. Charles County. So eventually, we came up with that first Missouri uh, compromise, and the Constitutional Convention was called back together at the Mansion House Hotel, uh, where uh, the apartments and hotel are in St. Louis now. Uh, led by Edward Bates. Uh, Bates will have a plantation in St. Charles uh, where Highway N and Highway K joined together in Darden Prairie. Uh, his, uh, he's married uh, to Julia Coulter, uh, whose sister happens to be uh, the wife of Hamilton Gamble, who just happens to get appointed Missouri governor uh, when the union takes over uh, Missouri. Uh, Bates was also uh, President Lincoln, although a slaveholder, was President Lincoln's first attorney general. Uh, when uh, Nathaniel Lyon ran Claiborne Jackson out of the state, uh, Lincoln was at a cabinet meeting and said, we really need somebody from Missouri uh, to take over as provisional governor. And Bates said, well, how about my brother-in-law? So it's one of those, <laughs> it sort of works well, who you know who's in the right place at the moment. Unfortunately, Gamble died in 24 um, after having an accident and uh, had uh, broken his arm. It was just healing and he fell again on the Capitol steps in Jeff City. Uh, so uh, we weren't gonna have slavery. We also had put in a provision uh, that uh, no free Negroes or mulattoes would be allowed to enter the state. And that was bringing our constitution again into question would we in fact be allowed to enter as a state? Uh, now 1820, the election came along, we elected two senators, we elected a representative, but they would not allow them to be sworn in until our constitution had been approved. So what are you gonna do? Now good old Henry Clay, uh, whom you may uh, have heard of as the great compromiser, uh, came up with a proposal. He actually had a financial interest in Missouri in that he had bought a farm not far from Bell Fountain Cemetery, where it is today, uh, for his son and set up uh, his son, John Henry, uh, as a gentleman farmer. Uh, he didn't make much money. Uh, he liked to spend most of his time gambling in St. Louis. Uh, but Thomas Hart Benton wanted to guarantee that his uh, son would be allowed to, to have slaves. Uh, and so he came up with the idea, all right, uh, we're going to prevent uh, we're free Negroes and mulattoes from entering the state unless they were already citizens of another state. Now, how you're gonna guarantee that they're already citizens of another state when they show up, uh, since uh, most African-Americans, most states at this time didn't issue birth certificates, uh, leads us with a quandary, but it was enough that Congress could pass our constitution. Now, our constitution had a number of uh, provisions in it that did not uh, exist in other areas that had slaves. Uh, you could not kill your slave. You could be arrested for that. You couldn't maim them. Uh, you were required to give them clothing uh, at least once a year. Uh, and if in fact uh, you had uh, violated their rights, they could sue for manumission. So in our uh, state archives and in county archives, we have a number of the uh, manumission uh, uh, suits that in fact were successful. So on August 10th, 1821, Missouri became a state. Uh, President Monroe issued the proclamation. Uh, our constitution was uh, approved by Congress, but not by a popular vote of the people. And they chose St. Charles as our temporary capital. Uh, rural Missouri did not want St. Louis. Uh, to be the capital. They felt there were too many people there who opposed slavery. Uh, it was also the center of most of the big banks and they did not trust the banks. And so they said, well, how about St. Charles? 
We got it because two brothers named Millington had an open pit coal mine uh, in Harvester. And they offered the legislature free coal for the time that they met in St. Charles. So they said, yeah, coal, free coal sounds like a good idea. We'll take it. So we were the first capital of the state of Missouri. Now, the legislature will continue uh, to do a number of laws limiting the rights of African Americans, both free and enslaved. Of course, they make it illegal uh, to teach them to read and write. Although both Rose Philippine Duchenne at her Catholic school and Catherine Collier at her Methodist school uh, were arguing that you can't be a good Christian unless you read the Bible and uh, we're, we're uh, educating African-American girls. Uh, there was a, a ban later put in that free Negroes and mulattoes could not enter the state. Uh, they were required uh, to provide at one point their naturalization papers, which of course, if you were born in the United States, you did not have. Uh, and uh, by 1835, you could, uh, if you were an African-American, you could purchase a license by putting up a bond to the county sheriff. If you didn't have the money for the bond, you could uh, apprentice yourself uh, to a free white person. Uh, so we have not necessarily in our history always guaranteed equal rights for all of our citizens. Now we're looking forward, we're looking backward because August 10th uh, will be the main uh, celebration for our uh, commemoration of our becoming a state. Uh, in uh, January of 2018, state legislature created two organizations. One is the Bicentennial Alliance that was put under the directionship of the State Historical Society in Columbia. And the other is the Bicentennial Commission that uh, is to actually plan the events in Jeff City. The job of the Alliance is to work with local historical societies, historic sites, uh, a group of speakers to go out and tell people what's going on and how they can get involved. So that's, uh, Jill, where I'm coming down to our, our topic for, for today. Uh, there were uh, originally just uh, six organizations uh, that met uh, at the governor's uh, mansion uh, to uh, sign the alliance. Uh, this is the representative of the Kinder Institute, uh, Gary Kramer, State Historical Society. Uh, myself standing uh, uh, next to Steve Belko from the Humanities Council. Uh, uh, Fran Levine from the History uh, Museum. Uh, we always say that when we get, get with this group, uh, we're the munchkins in the organization. Uh, but the idea is we would start uh, gathering groups. Uh, and I represent the Missouri Council for History Education. So we're the educational wing of trying to get teachers to introduce more information about the history of our state. Uh, and we've picked up now about 18 members, a few more uh, since I did this slide. Uh, we're promoting a number of activities. Uh, you may have received your bicentennial license plate if you had to renew recently. We also uh, started in 2018 endorsing uh, different activities that were being done around the state. And the idea was to, uh, once they uh, ask for endorsement, uh, then all of the sponsoring organizations would promote their activity. So if you were having an art fair or you were having uh, a, a talk by a historian about the history of Missouri, uh, all of our organizations will put it on their website and will encourage their members to, intent, to attend. Also planning a number of exhibits around the state uh, if you haven't gone to the Missouri History Museum recently, it is still open. Uh, they have an excellent um, exhibit called Beyond the Ballot, Women's Suffrage in Missouri, looking at influential women. You do have to uh, make an appointment since they're limiting the number of people. We also have a website and I'll talk a lot about it. And then 
uh, what Mochi has done is produce a curriculum that's online, free, available to teachers. Uh, our most recent group to join was the Daughters of the American Revolution, and they decided that their activity would be to renovate uh, a number of monuments and uh, stat historic uh, statues that they um, put up in the 1920s. And they're starting uh, with this re uh, restoration of the Madonna of the Trails. It's in Lexington, Missouri, which just happened to be uh, dedicated by County Judge Harry S. Truman back in 28. So we're looking forward to working with them. Uh, has everybody got your bicentennial plate? I hope. Uh, that was one of the, the activities of the Alliance, uh, getting a number of artists to help design a plate and then get the legislature to approve it. Uh, the, first org the first activity that we authorized as an official activity of the bicentennial was Louisiana, Missouri's bicentennial uh, in the summer of 2018. We had hoped for 15 to 20,000 people, but if you remember June of 18, it was over 100 degrees every day. Uh, but they did manage to pull off a parade and a number of activities. Uh, Louisiana, Missouri was the home of John Brooks Henderson, a congressman of, from uh, Eastern Missouri who wrote the 13th Amendment, end, Ending Slavery. Uh, in the United States. Uh, they uh, inaugurated a new statue uh, in Riverview Park, uh, had the parade, brought in some speakers about the history of Louisiana, history of Missouri, uh, and published a new book uh, on the history of the town. I had a little bit to do with that. All right, another activity uh, was to ask each county uh, to get their quilters to submit a square for a bicentennial quilt. Uh, eventually a commission selected uh, 115 squares representing uh, each of our 114 counties and the city of St. Louis to put together this quilt that will hang in the Capitol building. Now there were many other squares uh, that are going to be touring the state in an exhibit we hope next year when things open up again. If you have not been to uh, the Bicentennial Alliance website, it's Missouri2021.org, and you can look at the projects and what's coming up on the commemoration and events around the state that are being promoted uh, for our history. So please do that. Uh, some of the things that are on the website, one, uh, we ask for two years, 2018, 2019, for people to submit photographs of the state so that we could do a photo uh, exhibit encapsulating what Missouri looks like 200 years after its founding. Uh, it is on, many of them are online through the website. There also is a display that will be touring the state. Uh, unfortunately, it's sort of in limbo right now. Um, it's, let me see if I can jump ahead. Uh, it's supposed to be uh, in uh, the St. Louis area uh, come next summer. I go back to the, so it's gonna be, uh, it starts out at the Grants View, uh, which is down by the uh, uh, historic US Grant site uh, on Gravoy. So let me go back, let me go back here. And back another one. Uh, another is the Missouri Encyclopedia. They're asking each uh, county in the state and uh, each of the town, small cities and towns to submit an article about their state with, along with a few photos. Uh, and it's all gonna be done online uh, and will be uh, on the server uh, at the State Historical Society uh, so that uh, we can have uh, a, a more uh, updated history. Uh, the last large history of Missouri was written in the 1960s. And uh, if you haven't noticed, a few things have happened in the state since then. The next section is called Missouri Legacies. And we're asking people to write stories about individuals who lived in the state 
they don't necessarily have to be famous people, uh, but people who made a difference in their town. We're also asking organizations like the Mid Rivers Ethical Society to put together a couple of paragraphs about your organization, when it was founded, what it, its goals are, uh, what it hopes to be doing in the future, uh, and what impact it feels that it has had in its lo in the local community. So uh, we, if you have lived in a place like Louisiana, Missouri, or you've lived in a small town, or you'd like to talk about uh, O'Fallon or St. Peter's, uh, we'd love you to contribute to the Missouri Encyclopedia. Uh, Missouri Legacies, uh, if you've got ancestors who were here, um, particularly if you have any of their journals, we'd love to have uh, sections where people talk about what it was like uh, during uh, World War I or World War II. Uh, State Historical Society is uh, put together a press to get people to talk about uh, what it's been like uh, since 1945 in Missouri. Uh, people have a tendency to think that, well, historical societies like old documents. We want things uh, from the 1800s or 1700s. Uh, but we do need to start preserving now. Uh, on the State Historical Society uh, website, uh, there is a uh, section where you can enter uh, your pandemic journal uh, so that people 100 or 200 years from now can go, okay, what was it like in uh, St. Louis, uh, in the St. Louis area, uh, back in that giant pandemic? Uh, we have records from uh, the 1918 pandemic, but people will be of interest to know what you felt, how you were getting along. So we ask you to do that. So here's the exhibit, the photo exhibit that's going along. Uh, we selected just a few uh, of the 200 photos uh, for this exhibit and put them in uh, spring, summer, winter, fall. Uh, but you can go online and look at some of the photos that uh, made it into the exhibit and others that didn't. Uh, and there's some beautiful uh, photos that represent Missouri. I love this old barn. Uh, Morton, there's an old house north of, uh, on 79, north side, north of Louisiana. Uh, that's, uh, somebody took a beautiful photo of it's an old abandoned farmhouse, uh, brick farmhouse. Uh, that's part of the exhibit and really, really neat. I sort of like this one on Route 66, uh, where they made up a mock-up uh, of a 1960s Corvette and attached it to the wall. Uh, Part of the photo exhibit, also uh, a number of towns, uh, Chillicothe, I know, has done a mural exhibit around town, Louisiana, Missouri, what have we got, 28 murals around town. Uh, and so uh, telling the history of the community and what was there. Another activity is the Bicentennial Penny Drive. Uh, we started this with the schools uh, asking a school to contribute uh, 1,821 pennies. We don't want dollars. We don't want, <laughs> we don't want quarters. Uh, so that, you know, if you get each kid in your school to contribute a penny, uh, these are then turned over to the State Historical Society. Uh, some will be used to preserve documents they have. Uh, the rest of the money will be divided out among local historical societies that are trying to preserve their documents of Missouri history. Here in St. Charles, we have all the records of the territorial court. We also have many of the records of the first state legislature. Uh, so uh, we're trying to get uh, now organizations uh, to contribute also. And uh, you can... Uh, call or uh, email Michael Sweeney at the State Historical Society if you've got your jar with 1,821 pennies and we will make an arrangement for somebody to come by and pick it up. Uh, we also then present your organization or school with a certificate and uh, we hope down the road to be able to say here's the organization where your money went. This is the document you help preserve. Uh, I mentioned before that we have a curriculum it is online. 
uh, mohistoryeducation.org. It's available uh, free for teachers. It's also, uh, of course, available for people to look at. Uh, and uh, we took the uh, four people who were teenagers uh, in those years, 1818 to 1821. And what was going on in their community? What would the adults be talking about? Uh, I mentioned before Joseph uh, Bogie the, uh, the third. Uh, so what were the French people talking about in St. Genevieve and in the Catholic community? Uh, Sacred Son, who was uh, an Osage Indian uh, living near Arrow Rock. And uh, what was life like for her at that time? Uh, for uh, enslaved people, we had a bit of a problem because records are very sparse in order to get a name. But I did come across a family that lived uh, in uh, Southern Pike County, uh, an enslaved family. The, the grandfather was born here uh, in 1804. Eventually the grandson uh, will serve in the US colored troops uh, and establish his home uh, just across the border uh, uh, in Lincoln County. Uh, in doing the research, uh, I got in touch with descendants of uh, Dudley Johnson, uh, who was the, the Civil War soldier. And I said, I really want to use your family to center on what would, have, what would their life have been like? What things would they have been talking about? Of course, looking at will Missouri be free? Will Missouri be slave? And then how would they have felt when it suddenly Missouri came in as, as a slave state? Uh, and they continued. We know Dudley's father was Ned, uh, but everyone in the family simply referred to Grandpa Johnson. And one of the descendants said, we'll let you use the family, but don't you dare try to give him a name because we don't know it. He's just Dudley's grandpa. So I said, we will be uh, as uh, accurate as possible. Uh, the final person that we chose was Rosella Easton, uh, she was the uh, daughter of uh, Missouri's second attorney general, Rufus Easton. Uh, he had been the postmaster for the uh, uh, Missouri Territory. Uh, and uh, some of you may remember Easton Avenue, which is now Martin Luther King. Uh, he also bought a, a land in Illinois and started a little town that he named after his son uh, called uh, Alton. And uh, when uh, Rufus was in the Missouri State Legislature, uh, he lived uh, in a rented house across the street from the first state capitol building here in St. Charles. So many of the Missouri State legislators uh, would have gathered at uh, the Eastern household uh, to uh, sometimes have lunch uh, in the evenings over uh, whiskey to talk about what plans they had for the Missouri State Legislature. One of the activities we hope to do or had actually had planned for this fall was to be uh, a reenactment of the first day of the state legislature. We think politics are divided now. In uh, 1821, when our first legislature met on the first day, uh, two of the members of the House of Representatives got into a brawl and fist fight on the floor of the legislature. Uh, they were talking about, uh, there had been a pandemic, uh, 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 economic collapse uh, in uh, 1819, 1820. And many of the banks had gone out of existence and many of the rural farmers were arguing that the state should set up a fund from which farmers could borrow money to keep their farms going until uh, new banks would open up. So the Whigs who were in the legislature said, yes, that's a good idea. Uh, the Democrats uh, representing it, most of the slaveholders felt this would be a good opportunity to buy up these farms cheaply. They didn't want a bank uh, to be started. So one representative uh, picked up his inkwell and threw it at Duff Green and the two of them ended up on a fist fight uh, in front of the speaker's chair in the uh, Missouri State, Cap State Capitol here in St. Charles. 
So uh, we thought about maybe reenacting that argument and fight. Steve Belko from the Humanities Council said he would represent Green. And I said, I'll represent Alexander, uh, the wig who throws the uh, inkwell at you, but we'll have to make one out of a sponge or uh, get a, a Nerf uh, ball or something that so uh, I won't hurt you when I throw the inkwell. Now in St. Charles, we have a number of things that we're planning. Uh, we hope to have an online story map uh, that would tell about uh, important things that had happened across the city. We're using some of the uh, My Missouri photos. We'll be using some of the stories that are submitted for Missouri Legacy. And you would be able to click on a location and bring up a history. We'd also want to do uh, a uh, interactive map of the cemeteries across the county. Uh, we have 12 different organizations that have volunteered to provide docents. On a Saturday afternoon, we thought from noon until about five, and people would come to the cemetery, and every hour on the hour, there would be a 30-minute presentation about the people in that cemetery who had immigrated to Missouri, who had lived in Missouri, who had been important in our history, and uh, then you would be able to move on uh, and hopefully at least get five different cemeteries across the county to understand how important we were uh, in the history of the United States. In 1921, Governor Gardner uh, and his wife came to St. Charles uh, for the 100th uh, anniversary of our statehood. We had a large parade, uh, a big dinner, uh, a picnic on the riverfront, and we had been working on uh, planning to do that and also placing uh, a plaque on the uh, first state capitol for the bicentennial. Right now, unfortunately, everything is on hold, uh, but uh, please look uh, on the, the city website and also the Missouri State uh, our, our Bicentennial Alliance website, uh, and if you want to look at the um, Missouri History Education website, uh, we'll be putting those things up uh, as things finally get approved. Uh, then the week of August the 10th, there'll be a number of activities in Jeff City. Uh, as I said, we'd like to place a new plaque on the first state capitol building. Uh, this is the plaque that was put on in 1921. Uh, this is the governor. Uh, this is his, his wife. Uh, the young girl in the middle is named Dorothy Emmons. Uh, this is her father, uh, Benjamin Emmons IV. Her uh, third great grandfather had been in the first Missouri State Legislature. Uh, he then moved to St. Charles and established Emmons Title Company. Uh, I got this photo. Uh, from Dorothy's daughter. Uh, she happens to go uh, to the Episcopal Church. And when I was uh, speaking one day with Barbara Gasso, Barbara said, well, uh, I understand you're doing something with the Bicentennial. I said, yes, we're looking at putting a new plaque uh, on this, the first state capitol because they've lost the first one. We don't know what happened to it. I uh, in 1921, uh, when they had the bicent uh, the the, the uh, centennial, uh, the uh, Missouri State Legislature looked into buying the building, but the state doesn't actually do that until 1960, and so many of the plaques and things that had been put on the building had been lost. And Barbara said, "Well, could you use a picture of my mother in 1921?" And I said, "Well, that would be very nice." Uh, what connection did she have with the Bicentennial? Said, well, she unveiled the plaque. And I have a photo of her and the governor standing in front of the first state capitol building. So we managed to get this picture of Dorothy uh, and Governor Gardner in front of the plaque. And Dorothy Emmons has a great, great granddaughter who will be 13 years old next year. 
And if we can do the reenactment of the placing of the first plaque, uh, Barbara has decided, has agreed to convince her granddaughter uh, to uh, unveil the plaque for us and uh, try to recreate this photo in uh, 2021 for the uh, bicentennial. So you can take a look at how many people showed up in St. Charles uh, for the speakers uh, and uh, the unveiling of the plaque at the state cap uh, first state capitol building. I don't know if we'll have that many people uh, next year. Uh, hopefully, if we can get a COVID vaccine, uh, we can in fact uh, do some things. Otherwise, we're continuing with our Missouri legacies on the website. We're continuing with our Missouri encyclopedia. Uh, we'll continue uh, to do things like I'm doing today and talking with you guys. And I hope I haven't run too far over. It's at around uh, 1120 and uh, I'm a, about at that time. So any questions at this point? If you want to turn on your, your mics and your cameras, I'd love to see you. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything listed in the chat. So if anybody Nothing has- Nothing in the chat. No, but if anybody has a live comment or question, just go ahead. Uh, we did record it. So if you want to go back and look at any of the slides, they'll be available. So you can uh, take a look at what's going on. Go I hope, you know, hope Steve Belko and I get to do the fight in the first state Capitol building. Go ahead, Morton. Did you have a question? Uh, just a comment. Gary, that picture I saw Paul Woody took up in Louisiana, Missouri, uh, that was up on 79, I believe. And it's right across from the uh, Fairview Cemetery where my father's buried. Really? Yeah. Uh, I know it's probably difficult, uh, but there's a lot of those homes and barns and stuff up there were built by the Amish community. Uh, and of course, you know, they're not going to. Uh, uh, talk much about their history and things like that, but there, uh, but there was a lot of homes around Bowling Green, barns in Louisiana, Missouri, that uh, the Amish community had a lot to do with. You know, we need to get somebody to research that. I'll pass it on to Michael Sweeney, because we do need that in the mm -hmm. in the Missouri legacies and in the Missouri Encyclopedia. Uh, yeah, I. Uh, I, I have been up in that area, been up in that area at farmers markets and stuff, and uh, uh, luckily spoken with a number of them. Uh, very interesting because they're still still speaking the the German of the early eighteen hundreds. Yep. So yeah, uh, we used to I see a lot of them uh, along the highway there at sixty one around uh, Curryville, Bowling Green. A lot of times, sell them you know vegetables and stuff on the roadsides, and. Uh, you know, when we were growing up, we had horses, and my dad would always uh, take the horses up to them, and they would break them and train them. They were very good at, at horsemanship. Hmm. Well, I'll pass that on to Michael, because I don't imagine that uh, we've had an entry on them yet, and uh, they have played a significant part uh, in uh, particularly Pike County, Lincoln County, uh, in that area. Right. So we need to mention them. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Other questions? Sure. Um, I'm Kimberly, and I'm wondering what you're looking for from local businesses. I mean, if you're kind of modifying what we might need to do um, with COVID and what you're looking for. Well, we're hoping eventually we'll get some, some posters out that people can put up uh, and uh, directing people toward our website uh, so that uh, we can uh, uh, let people know that there are activities going on. Uh, so uh, again, we're, we're trying to, as the Bicentennial Alliance, we're trying to work through local historical societies, uh, historic sites, but we'd like to see particularly the August 10th week if people could dress in costume or uh, do a window display. Uh, this is what uh, my building, uh, here's the history of my building. Uh, St. Charles did some of that uh, for our recent uh, 
centennial here, uh, or centennial, sesquicentennial, uh, where we put up uh, some posters in, in store windows on here's the history of this lot and the people who lived here and when this building was opened. Uh, and uh, so that would really help to promote this. Okay. Steve Warner, did you have a question? Well, you just mentioned uh, Louisiana, Missouri, and uh, it, it has one of the coolest cemeteries around, that Riverview Cemetery, whatever right. it's called. It's just built up on the, on the hillside overlooking the Mississippi. It, it's, it's a cool place. And Governor Lloyd Stark is up there, uh, who uh, lost his bid for the Senate, uh, was, was running for the Senate, and got beat out by a guy from Kansas City named Harry Truman. Hmm. There's a comment in the chat thanking you for making Missouri history so interesting, Gary. Well, there's so much to tell. It's such a, fan it, it, it's such a fantastic story. And uh, unfortunately, as I said, our students aren't getting much of it in uh, school. Uh, so uh, our Council for History Education is trying to at least make some free uh, lesson plans and things available for download uh, because teachers are always looking for material, but they're also available for the public. So if you'd like to look at uh, the Johnson family was from Painesville. Uh, and, uh, so uh, if you'd like to look at the, the material, uh, it's open free. So uh, it's, it's there. Thank you. And uh, we need more Missouri history because we played a tremendous part uh, in Missouri history. Uh, this is a sideline yesterday, the St. Charles Civil War Roundtable did a uh, tour of uh, Civil War uh, graves uh, in Bell Fountain Cemetery. And uh, I took my great nephew along, who for 10 years lived in the second oldest house in Ferguson uh, that uh, was owned at one time by uh, General Sterling Price, who was the Confederate General's chief surgeon. And we do know at one time that Sterling Price, uh, they did a fundraiser for him uh, at their house and had a picnic in the yard. So uh, Dylan had never been over to visit uh, uh, William McFeeters, uh, who was the surgeon's grave, nor Sterling Price's grave. Hmm. And uh, so he's going, oh, well, Missouri history, how neat. Hmm. Does anybody know where the last Confederate capital of Missouri was during the Civil War? Claiborne Jackson fled the state, went to Arkansas, ended up in Texas. Hmm. And the last remnant of the Missouri legislature met in Marshall, Texas. Hmm. We didn't know there was going to be a quiz, Gary. Didn't know. <laughs> and sort of ironically, the, the last Confederate governor was, was Reynolds, and he is buried in uh, Bell Fountain Cemetery committed suicide by throwing himself down an elevator shaft oh my gosh. at a hotel in St. Louis. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, we've, all, we've got so many interesting people that were, were in our state. And uh, the connections with, uh, you know, Henry Clay, and uh, we normally think of East Coast people. We've, uh, one of the things that the DAR, of course, is doing is... Uh, replacing a number of the plaques on Revolutionary War veterans. Uh, there are three of them, I think, at Bell Fountain. Uh, here in St. Charles, uh, if you haven't been to Oak Grove Cemetery, one of the, the uh, first, when you come in, one of the large monuments is for Arnold Kreckel, who was a German immigrant, who was a newspaper editor, who was an abolitionist, uh, who was also the chairman of the committee that uh, at the the uh, that wrote uh, the Constitution in 1865 and signed in January of 65 the Declaration that emancipated all slaves in Missouri. The federal emancipation doesn't go into effect until December of that year. So our slaves had had been 
uh, emancipated for 11 months. Uh, and it was signed by a good old German out of St. Charles. Hmm. We have uh, one more question in the chat. It's probably the last one we'll have time for. It says, did we have a Confederate shadow government? I know the state did not join the South. We did join the South. We actually had a representative in the Confederate Congress uh, that met first in, met in Mississippi uh, and uh, then uh, in Virginia. Uh, they, there, there was a slight problem uh, because the legislature in Jeff City before Nathaniel Lyon and the Union troops ran them out voted to secede. And when Claiborne Jackson, the governor, fled the state, he took the state seal with him. Uh, so that when the new legislature met, they couldn't, they couldn't certify any of the laws that they were passing. Uh, however, we were put under the control uh, by uh, the Union Army of Hamilton Gamble, Edward Bates' brother-in-law. Uh, who served as uh, our uh, governor. And yes, we, they, the legislature moved to uh, Neosho. Then they were run uh, across into uh, Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Hmm. And then they uh, ended up uh, bypassing Little Rock because it had been taken by the Union and ended up in Marshall, Texas. Hmm. So we, we were in, if, if you are asked the question, was Missouri... Union or Confederate? The answer is yes. <laughs> Thank you for we had clearing that up. <laughs> we had representatives in both governments. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much, Gary. We really appreciate You're your welcome. Thank you. Information. Thank you. Thank okay. you.